media for the next economy. This week on The Laura Flanders Show, NBC recently reported that the Amazon Corporation, which already accounts for a quarter of all online sales, is in the process of buying up television channels. This just months after the Sinclair Broadcast Group, one of the largest owners of TV stations in the country, announced its plans to create a broadcasting behemoth reaching three quarters of TV viewers coast to coast. Online, just two non-media companies, Google and Facebook, have gobbled up the lion's share of revenues that used to come to newspapers, recording studios, editors, and reporters. After the fails of the last election year, it's their algorithms that are now deciding what's real news and what's fake and what you'll see. I've been writing about all of this for as long as I've been writing. And this week on The Laura Flanders Show, you're going to see an urgent conversation about media diversity and our lack of it. We can do better and we must. Coming up, a conversation and a field report on new media for a new economy. How can we get there fast? Welcome. You're watching The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. same technology that was supposed to deliver diversity, decentralization, and open access hasn't, at least not at the national level. Power is still concentrated, and the 2016 election proved what can happen when our elections are brought to us by corporations that put ratings and profits ahead of every other value. So what to do? In my new piece for the Democracy Collaborative and the Next System Project, I argue as strongly as I can that the crisis facing journalism needs solving, not just for journalists' sake, or even for that, but for the sake of our democracy and civil society. All show today, we're going to be hearing from people experimenting with new ways to solve this journalism problem. In studio, I'm joined by Joe Amditas. He's Associate Director of the Center for Cooperative Media in Montclair, New Jersey, and Drew Ojaje, a longtime independent media activist and hacker who has played a key role in both the Dominion and the Media Co-op, cooperative media initiatives in Canada, about which we are about to hear much more. Welcome to the program. Glad to have you both. Thank um, you. So let's start with you, Drew. Drew, what is the what was the Dominion? What is the Dominion? What is the media co-op? So the Dominion is a, a national newspaper that we started in Canada in uh, 2003, uh, and the media co-op is sort of um, the natural progression of that. We want to have progressive news. We want to have news from the grassroots, so news that starts with the people who are directly affected by issues uh, instead of starting with the people who are making the decisions about them or who have more at stake in terms of misleading people about them. We're not in a producer-consumer relationship anymore. We're not producing a product that we sell to people. We're all in this together. We all want good information. Um, we all want a media that doesn't have the corporate biases that, that, we're, that we're so familiar with. Um, and so instead what we'll do is create a democratic organization, a cooperative, um, that brings together readers, journalists, and editors as co-owners. Uh, and, and we'll run that democratically. Well, how do, you, how do you define the problem that gave rise to the center that you work at, Joe? Well, one of the biggest issues is the business model of journalism. It needs a drastic overhaul. Right now, it's inherently tied to advertising. That's one of the major sources of revenue. Um, and so really, uh, at its core, we need to figure out a new way forward, a new way to support it, which will also address a lot of the issues with uh, regard to biases and other uh, systemic and structural So forces. when you talk about cooperative media, you're at the center for cooperative media, and the, the media commons, I think you've talked about that too. Um, what do you mean? What, what do you mean by those words? There is uh, more value in working together than there are in remaining in these sort of, I know it's a tired phrase, but this sort of siloed relationship that we have where everyone is seeing everyone else as a competitor. They're working against each other because they think they're competing with, you know, the Star Ledger uh, or the Bergen Record, when in reality their biggest competitors are Facebook, or Google, or Yelp. 
Um, and once they realize that, that there is this sort of collective benefit, um, I, I think we'll start to see a lot more progress. And we have already seen the results speak for themselves uh, in terms of the work that we've been able to accomplish and the work that's left to do. So tell us a little bit about that. What are you all doing there in New Jersey? I think it's exciting. I, I, it, it certainly is. And right now, one of our biggest projects is the uh, collaborative reporting project around New Jersey's governor's race. And right now, we're working with over two dozen news, independent and uh, um, uh, corporate news organizations throughout the state, uh, all the way from your you know mom and pop shop uh, all the way up to uh, the Star Ledger to uh, Asbury Park Press to drill down to the community level focus on individual neighborhoods and blocks throughout New Jersey uh, to understand how the voters and the communities that are going to be affected by those votes uh, how they see the issues and how they see the candidates. Now you use the word cooperative in a different way from the way that you use it. You actually set up a different ownership structure. Can you talk about that? So the traditional sort of shareholder model has basically a one dollar one vote. You invest one dollar you get you know a, per a vote proportional to how much you've invested but with a cooperative model th the point isn't to create shareholder profit, the point is to serve the membership, the journalists, the readers, uh, and the editors. And so together, um, they each get sort of one vote. And then, and then we made a little more complicated spin on that where we created member classes of, of each of those. Mm. The board of directors would meet regularly and they'd be elected from each of the member classes um, and they would make the major strategic decisions about, about the, the cooperative. Um, and then annually at the AGM, we'd have a, a report where we are accountable to all the members. How do we get the best journalists to be part of a cooperative like that, where it's really about the group, as it should be? I think that journalists will go where there's an audience and where there's a, a paycheck. Um, and so I don't think it's very hard to get to get them to be cooperative if that's their job. Um, I, currently, I don't think it is their job for most people um, or for most media organizations. Um, and certainly, it's it's their job to serve increasingly billionaires who own own the corporate media, uh, you know, and not the readers. Um, and so there's and, and and obviously the the advertisers are sort of behind that because they're the, where the money comes from. And so you have a perverse incentive structure. Um, and I think if we change the incentive structure, we'll change the journalism and, and the way it's done. What have you found? What's been your experience in terms of people's willingness to work together and what they've gotten out of it? I think the idea of working together towards a greater goal is a lot more appealing to folks, regardless of anywhere they fall on that spectrum, uh, than people sort of assume. Even though, as you said, journalism is a competitive business. It is, but it is only competitive insofar as you are the structures and the systems that you're working within. So in capitalism, of course, it's competitive because it's a zero sum or it's seen as a zero sum game. But the work, look at Sedoche Zeitung and the Panama Papers and the stuff that they were able to accomplish on a collaborative level is far exceeds anything that we've seen really in recent history. Uh, when it comes to an individual organization. And in fact, they would not have been able to work uh, at that level and accomplish what they did and the impact that they've, uh, they've achieved were they to work on their own or individually. You've actually got a report you're about to release as we're speaking on exactly this topic. Yes, Dr. Sarah Stonbley uh, is our research director at the center and she's going to be releasing a report on September 29th. Comparing Models of Collaborative Journalism is the title of the paper and she looks at and identifies, uh, I believe the number is 500 uh, collaborations or organizations who are working in collaborations with others. Uh, and she delineates six different models of, of collaborations that are currently active, ranging from the temporary and separate where the organizations sort of produce stories and do the journalism on their own and then combine it to distribute it together all the way up to the ongoing and integrated uh, variety where the organizations share data, share proprietary software and they really become merged at a level that um, you just don't see in an, a normal competitive sort of zero-sum environment. And the result in terms of the maintenance of jobs and information and access to information for consumers and viewers? Well, the, the results speak for themselves. I think you, you'll see that in, in instances where cooperation is encouraged and where it's practiced, um, the pr the, the result is a much higher quality of journalism and much more widely distributed um, range of, of consumers and audience members. Folks are able to get their hands on this reporting much easier because it's redistributed across multiple outlets in multiple communities. And it can also then be localized uh, at, at various levels to fit the needs of those communities as they differ, uh, whether it's geographically or uh, demographically. But you faced some challenges in Canada, didn't you, with the media co-op? Um, I think we might have set a, a smaller potential audience than we could have. 
um, and and you know parts of our network were able to sort of break out of that and really reach and really become a part of the local media landscape and to uh, and to become quite influential um, and 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 they did that I think by reaching out and creating a, a, a broader alliances um, with the community um, in terms of the overall challenge I mean I think I think really it's a paradigm shift and that we're not quite ready to have yet that sort of mental shift from a from a producer consumer relationship to a cooperative relationship where we're all we're all seeing this as part of the public good um, and maybe even getting public financing coming in as well. So how do you address the challenge of already existing member supported media? There's a lot of it in this country. A lot of us feel like we're being crowdsourced over and over again and it's a fairly small crowd. So how do you distinguish the cooperative experience from that one? Um, well, two things. One, I think, is is ownership. I think it's really key to say that you know, if we're building a big media institution, that it's not it's not going to separate itself from it from its contributors at, at a certain point. It's going to it's going to be accountable to them, you know, institutionally um, as well as financially. And I think that's a really key difference. Um, I think the other thing is is just we need we need to be brought we need to be aiming at a much bigger audience. Um, you know, it would cost to to employ employ the the number of full-time journalists that we had uh, at the peak of journalism in the 90s um, would cost about $13 per person per year in the U.S. So if we can if we can make a bigger um, audience uh, and a and a bigger pool of potential contributors um, and even get sort of you know municipal governments involved in financing media, I think we can um, we can make a lot more progress. Well, let's talk about that. Do you see a role for public spending in this area? I, I certainly do, and I would say almost going in a, in a different direction, more more local. Journalism is at its core a public service, or at least it should be, um, and we need to fund it like one. Uh, and one of the models for doing that is a municipal mechanism called a special service district that allows uh, communities to come together and decide this is a public service that we need. But that's one of the models that's being explored at the moment. There's another one called Report for America, uh, a combination of Teach for America and the Peace Corps. Uh, and they're trying to put a thousand new journalists in communities across the country. And uh, in doing so, they solicit funds from local donors. Uh, but the Google News Lab will, in fact, pay for uh, half of that journalist's salary. And then the local donors and contributions go in the other half. I have to say, you know, for the article I just did for the Next System Project, I looked at the ways that movements had affected media policy just in the last hundred years. And it happens again and again and again with every new means of media, media mechanism, radio. People got together to defend a non-commercial part of the radio spectrum. Television, people got together, same thing, to demand some local programming. We got laws passed around local programming. That's why we have local news in half of the states around the country. Um, when, ca when cable came in, we saw people organizing around um, public education and public access stations to be funded by a tax on the cable stations. And I have to wonder, like, where is that movement today as we look at the internet and in this transition? I see a lot of experimentation, and the two of you reflect that. What's the relationship to movements and the demands we make of our society to consider journalism a public good? And pay for it. Well, Free Press is actually doing uh, freepress.net, uh, the community uh, advocacy organization in New Jersey in particular. Uh, Mike Rispoli and his team has been working on uh, a campaign in New Jersey. They've been going around to communities all across the state and getting the input and really trying to get their finger on the pulse of what these communities need and what they want. And then they're trying to bring that energy and that movement uh, to Trenton to pressure lawmakers to use the funding that's already available in the form of the Spectrum auction. They sold a bunch of public broadcasting licenses. There's a couple hundred million dollars at stake, and it's available. And what they're trying to do is form a civic information consortium, which would direct this funding to the communities that need it uh, on a basis, on a needs basis, so that they are getting the, the public information that they need and not just whatever sounds like the neatest idea at the time. In a way, your proposal lets the state kind of off the hook. Thoughts on that? Um, the state absolutely has a role to play. I mean, in public broadcasting, it clearly, clearly it's been demonstrated over and over again, informs people better than corporate media. The, the key is to how, how can we, you know, not just have public funding, but cooperative management. Yeah. I would love to see a, a governance structure similar to that in something like these community information districts or these new models. I, I think there is, there's no um, distance between what 
the model you're proposing and these new structures and new you know initiatives. I believe very strongly that this needs to be a central element of our conversation about a next system, a new economy, all of the stuff we talk about on this show because we're not going to get any of it if we don't have media that reports on it and is open to new ideas. So thank you all. Thanks for your work. Thanks for having Appreciate us. Appreciate it. Um, you can find out more at our website. That's lauraflanders.com or org. Thanks. When it comes to media access, ownership, and representation, the people of the city of Detroit know just what happens when power is out of public hands. They've seen the consequences of negative coverage and misinformation, and they've learned a thing or two about how to fight back. Here's some of what I found on a visit to the city this September. Co-funding for this reporting came from the Next System Project. If you're just watching the news, you would probably believe that Detroit is totally blighted and that it has uh, totally deteriorated over the past 50 years under the leadership of primarily African Americans. And at this point in time that the city is totally bankrupt, is over 18 million in debt, and that the city has to be uh, saved from itself. I think also part of the narrative has been that the city is coming back. And a lot of times what we have to educate people on is that we ask the question coming back for whom? Uh, and then we also ask the question in terms of all of the blighted properties, where did the people go? There are people here in the city of Detroit that have a voice that would like to fight against these issues and uh, the media is not really covering it. For Allied Media Projects, media is every way in which we communicate with the world. So if you go to our conference, the Allied Media Conference, you'll find workshops in digital storytelling, uh, web design, graphic design, journalism, but you'll also find uh, workshops in culinary arts and um, fashion as communication and theater and dance. We really root ourselves at the intersection of media and social justice, so uh, the many strategies that communication tools and processes allow us to forge new types of relationships, communicate ideas that ultimately are going to uh, lead us to the, the world that we want to see. We are in Cinema Detroit, which is um, connected to the Office of Allied Media Projects. Um, it's an independent movie theater here in Midtown. <laughs> stories about Detroit, the narratives of Detroit that come out that other people are seeing that aren't from here are often not the full story. There's more to the picture than what movies like uh, Detroit or other popular movies about Detroit often depict. DNA, the Detroit Narrative Agency, in its first phase offered seed grants to 10 local moving image projects that were based in shifting narratives specifically about Detroit towards more justice and towards a more just, authentic view of that narrative. We've had some really actually very interesting projects, diverse group of projects. I think one of them that sticks out is particularly about land. And this revitalization of the city, the government and corporations are buying up land um, and maybe not even doing anything with it. You know, they've bought land that just kind of sits and they're waiting for the moment to kind of build something there. Um, and then at the other end of that, you have people who have lived in these neighborhoods who are living by these vacant lands who have decided that they are going to grow food on it or they are going to make it into some type of community space. And this particular story talks about the ways that black and brown farmers in the city have been repurposing vacant lots and have been really pushed out from being able to officially like buy that land and own the land. The city wants less vacancies. The city wants to be like, to look like this kind of new, you know, bright, like place. Um, but at the same time, they're not allowing Detroit residents, Detroit families to purchase land in a way that's accessible or that's affordable. There's a lot of new development happening in the city, which is very new. It's happening rapidly. Um, and it's a little disconcerting, I think, to those that have been here um, for a very long time that have struggled without any funding, any support, and with a corrupt government. 
Um, it feels as though the, the development is not happening for those people. The development is actually happening for a new tax base to come in and sort of pull us out of you know, our emergency management and our bankruptcy. The thing that's pretty intense about Detroit's connectivity is um, that 40% of folks don't have broadband. Um, and then like 33% of those live below the federal poverty level, which means that even affording broadband is, is kind of impossible. The way in which we've addressed um, digital access and broadband adoption here in Detroit is through community technology. To do this work of community technology requires both community organizing and uh, IT expertise. And so Anderson Walworth here and myself have been working on um, wireless networks, learning everything we can about them, teaching several communities, both here in Detroit, in New York, and around the world on how to do both the IT and the community organizing aspects of it. Anderson can sort of show you around this uh, to tell you what the routers are, what they do, and how we make um, a community wireless network. Also what the intranet is, which is where the apps live, and that's um, uh, those are resources that you can access without the internet connection. Never loved heights. I've kind of had to force myself up these rooftops for the last five years. So we're on the rooftop of Allied Media Projects. There are um, four or five routers up here. This is one of our, our nodes or one of our, our mesh routers. And this one in particular, it, it, it actually is off kilter. It's supposed to be pointed this way towards the hardware store, and it's not. So it's good that we came up here. I mean, the obvious thing it can do, if you hook it up to an internet connection, it will share it to the rest of the routers in the network. But another thing it can do is it can host local applications or local servers. So, um, you could host any anything from um, like a Minecraft server or um, like we have an app that hosts local stories and poetry from the, from the neighborhood that everyone can access on the, the network. More than half the work is the organizing part. It's just getting to know your neighbors, getting to know the local organizations and finding other people to help support the network. For me, one of the best ways of communicating and learning about what's going on is through talking to other people. The Allied Media Conference is a nexus of that kind of sharing for us. Our role is to hold that space and to make it the most generative space possible for these types of critical connections and new ideas. I do think it's possible for media to model and, and really embody that type of exchange of knowledge across places. People should constantly be thinking about how do we create our own platforms, how do we get more of our stories out there, how do we show more and more people. I think it's a, about the infrastructure. Like what is the current ecosystem that's available for all of this to thrive in and is there one? And if there's not one, okay, well then how do we make that happen or how do we make that possible, how we plug in to maybe some other infrastructure ecosystem that's available. What does that actually mean and feel like and actually look like to do something that's collaborative and creative and successful? And what is success? How do we measure it? <laughs> Detroit, to me, is inspiring because it's a movement city. Detroit was central to the rise of the labor movement. It was central to the expansion of the civil rights movement to the north. Certainly it was at the center of the black power movement. Uh, and today it's at the center of a different type of revolutionary movement. One that defines revolution not through militancy and not through simply taking control of the political structures, but of recreating and rebuilding community through human values that stress the importance of relationships, taking care of each other, taking care of the earth, um, and not waiting for someone else to come in and do that. I think out of that mindset of self-determination and cooperative work, uh, we have created a model for the world that is not only about being able to uplift what the problems are, but to also be able to uplift that we have solutions. In the like super long term, the end goal would definitely be to have these narratives be the ones that we're watching, the ones that people are seeing uh, across the country and across the world, and the ones that they're using to refer to the city.
when they're talking about what happens here. I've just finished a report on this subject that is available now from the Next System Project, as well as at our website. What might the next system of media look like? Check it out at lauraflanders.com and thenextsystem.org. We've also completed a report on what assets exist in grassroots organizations to tell their own stories and how those assets might better connect. That, too, is available at our website. Check it out. Join with us. Become a subscriber to this program and support the platforms that carry it. We're counting on you. We can't do this alone. We can only do it together. But together, we can remake this media world. And we will. Thanks.